very serious up to now. This is this is a sort of child's play, but it's something I got interested in uh, a few months ago. We're going to a conference in Oval Ballpark, which was a conference ostensibly between mathematicians and quantum chemists, which is uh, like oil and water. I've never seen less communication. Uh, <laughs> But it was only after I got home that I, I realized that, well, there was at least one thing I understood uh, as being possibly interesting. And, and then I got these wonderful people, Rupert Frank and Robert Zeiringer, who's here somewhere. I don't know where Robert, no, there's Robert. And uh, I see him talk, and we started to chew over a problem in density functional theory. Now, some people may know that I was not always a fan of density functional theory. I'm still not a fan of density functional theory, but it, it seemed uh, to me that uh, personal likes and dislikes are irrelevant uh, when you have to try to do science. And without, this, the, without density functional theory, it seems that the chemist can't get very far in doing some very important things that we will all benefit from. And if that's the way they're going to do it, then I guess we may as well join in and try to be helpful. So that's what, uh, let me see. Yeah, so quantum chemists, a subgroup of all chemists, I don't know uh, if they're really chemists because uh, they don't actually go in laboratories and mix things, but they try to understand uh, matter and they try to compute efficiently ground states of uh, Schrodinger Hamiltonians uh, for large molecules, and large means large. But of course you have to start someplace, so they first try to compute the properties of atoms and diatoms. And <clears throat> this uh, work w would uh, have many practical benefits, such as being able to eliminate uh, trial and error in the design of medicines. And uh, to some extent, this is true. Uh, it's beginning to be true even now, but it's uh, far from uh, completed. Much more has to be done. Now, one possible route that has attracted attention is density functional theory. Uh, I think most of you know about the code, who got a Nobel Prize for uh, this, although he didn't really originate it, but he was certainly uh, he certainly promoted it uh, very much and did a lot of the fundamental work and so did lots of other people. But density functional theory turns out to have limitations, very severe limitations, namely it doesn't work. Uh, but <laughs> but and that doesn't mean people give up, they just try to improve it. And the latest uh, version of this story is something called reduce the density <coughs> matrix functional theory. Uh, the hyphens are mine. Usually they leave the hyphens out. But uh, that's really one word. R-D-M-F-T. So that's what I would like to speak a little bit about. Uh, so just to make sure that uh, uh, everybody can see this. How is it? Sound is a little funny. I have to speak into the thing. So, just so that everybody knows what I'm talking about, this is the Hamiltonian for non-relativistic matter. Uh, there's a kinetic energy term, which is Planck's constant squared divided by twice the mass times the Laplacian, and then the <coughs> one body potential, which is the potential the electric potential from a many nuclei making up the molecule, and these are regarded as fixed at certain locations. The motion of the nuclei is not unimportant, but it's uh, relatively unimportant. And so the usual approximation people make is to regard these things as fixed somewhere, and you want to calculate the energy as a function of these positions, and then minimize the energy with respect to those positions. And what comes into play then is the electrostatic repulsion of the nuclei among themselves, which is given by Coulomb's law in this way, and that's, that's what will determine 
the equilibrium position of the atoms in the molecule. Then there's the electron repulsion. This is x. The x's are the coordinates of the electrons. Everybody knows this. And that's the complete Hamiltonian. Except for some fine things, which some fine points which are left out, namely magnetic fields which should go in there, and also relativistic effects. I don't know how many of you know that <coughs> some quantum chemists at least claim that the, uh, the crowning glory of their subject is being able to predict or explain why gold is gold. Namely, if you didn't have relativistic effects, uh, which are largely uh, connected with the inner innermost electrons in an atom, if you didn't have these relativistic corrections, then gold would look like silver. So apparently this small shift in energy is enough to make gold look like gold. So that's the, the gold standard, so to speak, of quantum chemistry. Right. But, all right, so that's, so now some uh, basic definitions. So we're interested in calculating the ground state, uh, which means we're interested in finding the ground state wave function. And the notation here is that the symbol x denotes a spatial coordinate and the spin coordinate. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm going to confuse these things. So uh, I won't talk about spin particularly, so just ignore it. But if you want to be precise, uh, dx means a sum on, uh, on the spin and an integral over x. And we can define a density by integrating, taking the square of the ground state wave function, or there could be several, but we take one of them, and then uh, integrating over all but one variable, <coughs> multiply by n, and that's the density of electrons at x. Now really, uh, x means little x, because usually you also sum over the spin of this last electron. So this density, uh, integrates out to n, which is correct, that's the number of electrons. So density functional theory is built out of trying to find the energy as a function of the density. So <clears throat> we want to find the functional, which is called script E of the density, so that uh, when we minimize it over all densities subject to the sole condition that the integral of the density is n, and subject, of course, to the requirement that the density is not negative, of course, which it must be, that infimum or minimum is, in fact, the correct answer. That's what we'd like to be able to do. And so far, so good. We would also like to know that the density that minimizes this energy, the rho, is, in fact, the correct rho. So that's two things. Now, of course, there's not always a minimum because if I try, for example, to make n too large, uh, suppose I have a hydrogen nucleus and n is uh, 10, it's not going to work. The, the infimum will really be an infimum and not a minimum. The name of the system will not be found. So I don't expect always to find a minimum. Uh, and the question of when there's a minimum and when it's just an infimum, of course, is the question of uh, when you support negative ions or not. So, uh, right, so this uh, energy, this minimum, uh, will depend on the nuclear coordinates. So minimization of the total energy with respect to the nuclear coordinates will determine the binding and the molecular geometry. That's the idea. And Chemists are very far from being able to do that. Uh, now, the, the program sounds simple enough, uh, except it's uh, virtually impossible to carry out. Uh, and uh, it's, so it's possible in principle. And after some changes of the rules of the game, uh, it is impossible in practice. So, that is to say, it's, in principle you can do it, you, practically you cannot do it, carry out the program, but if you're willing to close your eyes 
and ignore some of the rules that you're supposed to follow, the rules of logic, uh, you can come up with answers. And these answers are sometimes very good. And that's the mystery. So for example, uh, you can calculate uh, the binding angle of a water molecule to the rate of accuracy, but you have to uh, be willing to uh, suspend judgment in certain <laughs> places, but it works. That's the amazing thing. You can calculate this uh, shift in the uh, levels of gold in order to get the color gold to come out, but uh, if you probe and you say, well, what did you do logically? What's the, where did you start and where did you go in the middle and where did you end up? You'll find very evasive answers and for very good reason because the logical structure is not, not there, but the practicalities are there. And that's, that's the interesting thing, that it works uh, like a, a bee flies, even though it's not supposed to fly. But, so quantum chemistry works even though uh, it shouldn't. But uh, we have to figure out how to make it work. All right, so now the oldest example of this kind of thing uh, goes long before, way before Walter Cohn. It goes back to Thomas and Fermi, who independently found the first uh, density function. And it's remarkably good. Uh, so <clears throat> let me explain what they did. Uh, they said, well, the kinetic energy term uh, cannot be expressed in terms of the density. That's pretty clear. Uh, just knowing the density doesn't tell you how rapidly the wave function wiggles. But nevertheless, we could ask, given the density, what is the minimum uh, that the kinetic energy could be given the density? And that is presumably this magic number times the integral of the density to the 5 thirds power. So that Thomas and Fermi understood this, although they didn't write it this way, it was actually Lentz uh, who wrote it in this form, as far as I know. We still don't know uh, precisely if uh, this coefficient is the correct one. Um, we know it's, it's true in the semi-classical limit. Uh, we know uh, it's true with a smaller constant. This is what Walt and I proved. Uh, but uh, we all believe that this is the correct number, uh, but there's no proof at the present time. Uh, but it surely is correct. Then the, uh, the next term is just the integral of the density against the one body potential. That's, of course, exact. There's no problem with that. That's the nuclear uh, uh, electrostatic attraction to the nuclei. And then there's this approximation to the electron-electron uh, repulsion, which is just from classical electrostatics, the product of the density at x and the density at x prime divided by the distance, which is <coughs> A reasonable approximation, but which uh, doesn't take into account correlations. So the electrons would like to stay away from each other, and that's critical, absolutely critical, but very difficult to quantify. Uh, you can give error terms to this, uh, which are of lower order, and that's very satisfying. But uh, it turns out that these little effects are of critical importance, and we need much better, something much better than the crude error terms we have at the present time. And then, of course, there's the nuclear-nuclear repulsion. So all of this goes back to 1927, which is not bad. And it's hardly gotten much better since, <laughs> if you really want to. I mean, because this was a, a really a, a big step forward. And, uh, of course, it, there's been improvements since 1927, but compared to this huge first step, uh, uh, it's not, no, it's very impressive. Uh, so it has some, uh, also some unrealistic features, unrealistic meaning that atoms don't bind in this theory, unfortunately, which took until the 50s to figure out. And it was uh, Heller and then Wigner who understood why it couldn't, in this theory, atoms could not bind. Uh, namely, if they did bind, then the energy of the, the binding energy would have to be huge, which it's not. So either the theory is no good, or it doesn't bind. And indeed, it doesn't bind. This was proved by Teller. So 
So you have this beautiful theory of atoms and molecules, which is very accurate. It's accurate to leading order in the charge of the nuclei, but it doesn't give binding. So it's no use for chemists. Well, I shouldn't say no use, but it doesn't answer the questions of quantum chemistry. But it's a good starting point to get the bulk features of atoms. So there have been many improvements. There's been uh, the Dirac correction, the uh, Weizsäcker correction. Uh, then uh, there was a period when quantum chemists were using fourth order derivatives uh, here, and uh, uh, sometimes third order derivatives, and all of which, uh, not all of them, some of which was grossly nonsensical because if you took it seriously, you would get minus infinity. Uh, <coughs> But uh, nevertheless, people persevered. So all these corrections um, were, were helpful and, and good and so on, but uh, not good enough. So what has become increasingly popular is uh, density matrix functions. So we have to see this out. Matrix. So such functionals then will be functionals of the density matrix, which I will define in a moment. Uh, they're much more complicated than density functional such as this, but they're increasingly more popular. <coughs> now, one of the oldest that goes again back to the <coughs> sorry, back to the uh, 20s uh, or early 30s is the Hartree-Fock function. But the Hartree-Fock functional or the Slater functional, as it's also called. Uh, was not originally understood to be a density matrix function. It, it was not understood in that light. It was understood as a variational calculation. I'll explain it in a moment in the next view uh, But it's been around, and it's probably, I think it's fair to say, it's the oldest density matrix function there is. But before I explain it, let me define uh, density matrix. chemistry, or physics, physical chemistry. So again, I go back to the uh, one body, uh, so, sorry, the, the, the wave function for the n body system. And this time I take, uh, take it squared, but not the same coordinates. That is, the first coordinate is different x and x prime, the others are the same, and, and I again integrate over all but the first, and I multiply by n. So now this is a function of x and x prime, <coughs> and that's called the one body uh, reduced density matrix. One because it's one part. So if I put x equals x prime, I get the previous density, and the trace of this object, thinking of this as an integral kernel, uh, the trace of this object is obtained by putting x and x prime the same and integrating, and that's of course n because that's the old density. <coughs> and you can also see from the construction that this is a positive definite kernel. So it's Hermitian and positive definite, and it has a trace. And <coughs> one other important point is that you can prove that for fermions, this gadget has eigenvalues between 0 and 1. The proof of that is just an exercise in linear algebra, but you have to approach it the right way, otherwise you don't see it. Uh, now, it turns out that this condition is, uh, on the one hand, necessary and sufficient, on the other hand, it's insufficient. Depends how you look at it. Uh, if you want, the, if you just take a bunch of numbers lying between 0 and 1 that add up to n, then, or if you take any density matrix with this, with this property, then it does not necessarily come from a construction of this kind. But it always will come from a mixed state of this kind. That is to say, you can take a mixture of pure states of this kind. And from that perspective, the only condition you need to know is that the eigenvalues are between 0 and 1. That's necessary and sufficient. But if you demand that it come from a pure state, uh, this is not enough information. But we don't care, because we're perfectly happy to have mixed states. 
And indeed, ground states of atoms uh, are not necessarily, uh, the, the, the size of the ground states are not necessarily unique. Uh, so taking uh, a mixture is not necessarily a bad thing, but one has to understand that. So the, the, uh, the non-uniqueness which will show up as a, a orbit, as a, a, a shape which is not necessarily spherical, that non-uniqueness will not show up, or not necessarily show up, if we just take this condition. But that's what we're going to do. Okay. Uh, now, we're going to minimize functionals of gamma, this thing, under the conditions that gamma is between 0 and 1, and the trace of gamma is n. So what shall we take for these functions? <coughs> for example, if if uh, any well, any uh, oops, that's supposed to be a gamma. Sorry. So any gamma can be written in terms of its orbitals, uh, and if if we take a slated determinant, then the orbitals uh, of, then gamma is just the product of the projectors, of some of the projectors onto the states phi that make up the slated determinant. But in general, we can expand gamma uh, in terms of its uh, uh, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, provided the eigenvalues <coughs> are between 0 and 1. So if we take the hartree fock functional, that is, we take this state that I had before and compute uh, the expectation value of the energy, I end up with the following strange expression, but very familiar. Namely, first of all, there's a trace of gamma against the one-body uh, energy, the, the kinetic energy and the one-body potential energy. There's the direct term that I spoke about before, so that's there. We're very happy to see that. But then there's a term that has something to do with the correlations. You can view it that way. It's called the exchange term, and it looks like this. It's the gamma squared as a function squared divided by x minus x prime. So the total electrostatic Coulomb repulsion is the sum of these two. This is the main part, and then there's this negative part, which takes into account the correlations. <coughs> so that's what you get if you take a slated determinant and you compute the expectation value. Now, what does this have to do with density functionals? Well, it was shown in 1981, I showed that, that uh, in fact, if you take this object, which remember goes back to the uh, 30s, certainly, if you take this object with gamma stuck in there, and you minimize that, you forget about where it supposedly came from, you just take this thing and you minimize it, then it turns out uh, we minimize, of course, with this condition. Don't forget the condition. And then the minimum of this, or the infimum of this energy over all possible gammas, is in fact the slated determinant. So that if you forget about where this came from, namely from a slated determinant, you just use this functional and minimize it, you'll end up with a slated determinant. So that's why this is a density matrix functional that you have to try to minimize. So, put it another way, you don't have to guess the orbitals to make a slated determinant to make this energy. You just have to minimize this energy and it will automatically give you the correct orbitals in the slated determinant. Uh, so the situation is that for any gamma, this functional of gamma, this number, is bigger than the Hartree-Fock energy, which comes from the slated determinant. And that's bigger by the variational principle than the true ground state energy. So the Hartree-Fock theory is, becomes a density matrix energy minimization theory, which is what it was all along, except nobody realized it. And it's probably the earliest one of its kind. Now, it was, has been very heavily used, of course, throughout the years. And we know something about its good points and its bad points. It's also used in condensed matter physics a great deal. And uh, it certainly has effects, but there's something uncanny about this. Uh, when you do a hartree fock calculation, and if you do it carefully and unrestrictedly, you end up with something that is probably close to the truth. 
uh, it has no reason to be accurate. And it's not numerically always very accurate. But in qualitatively, it's much better than you would think. It's just a, a, a fact of life. I don't know why it's true, but it's a fact of life that somehow this minimization problem uh, is worth doing. Now, the second density matrix functional, well, so there have been, of course, many improvements to Hartree Fock and, uh, and so on, which I will not go into, but uh, a particular multi configurational interaction, and so you take sums of determinants and so on. And if the system you're looking at is very small, like an atom, you can get very accurate results. But that doesn't really help us with problems of several atoms. We still would like to have a density functional, a density matrix functional that we can just use. Now, the quantity replacing the two particle density, now this is not the density matrix, this is the density. This is the probability finding an electron one at x and one at x prime. Two particle density in Hartree Fock theory is this combination. Because remember, the, the, uh, the, there were two terms in Hartree Fock theory that uh, told us what the Coulomb reversal was. One was the density density direct interaction, that's the classical energy, and the other was this exchange term. Both of these divided by x minus x prime. So, <coughs> So what Harvey Fock, the theory is telling us is that we're going to replace the two-body density by this peculiar uh, combination that depends only on the one-body density. So can you <coughs> predict it or say or know what the two-body density is if you know the one-body density matrix? And the answer, of course, is you can't. But one thing that this object does not do correctly is satisfy a sum rule. So what does this mean? Well, if I take the two-body density, whatever it might be, and integrate over one of the variables, then of course I have to find the one-body density. That's just from the definition. But if I take this object and integrate over one of the variables, x prime for example, then what I end up with, it's easy to, to see, is, uh, uh, sorry, I should end up with this, but if I do this integration here, I end up with something quite different, something that's too big. So this does not satisfy uh, the sum of, sorry, I stated it incorrectly, excuse me. What I should have said was, when you integrate this over one of the variables, you get the one body density, but there's a combinatorial factor that I forgot to mention. So you should end up with this. Whereas if you take this object here, you do not end up with this. The only time you do is when gamma is a projection, that is to say, when it comes from a certain determinant. So back in 1984, Merla uh, proposed the following. He said, uh, well, this Harvey Fock functional looks pretty good, but there's something wrong with this exchange energy. Let's try to improve it so that <clears throat> when, I, when I, I will make a sum, substitute something else here in such a way that this sum will be satisfied. So what can we substitute? Well, what he substituted was the square root of gamma in place of gamma, which is a little bit odd, but that's what he did. <coughs> now, the square root of gamma means the following. It's this operator square root. So you take this uh, one-body density matrix, which you don't know, but anyway, you take it, and you take its uh, square root, meaning that the square root satisfies the square root of, from uh, gamma uh, one-half xy times gamma one-half uh, y x prime integrated dy is gamma. So that's the operator square root in that sense. Now, if you take that and you integrate over x prime, then you see here, the integration just gives you gamma back again from this rule. And you get exactly the sum rule that you're supposed to get. So Willis' uh, remark was, it's, let's follow Hartree Fock. Let's make one change, namely replace gamma in here by the square root of gamma. 
Now, if gamma is a projector, as it is in this for slated determinants, then gamma to the one half is exactly gamma. The eigenvalues are one, and we haven't changed anything. But otherwise, we have changed things. This becomes this exchange term becomes bigger. So the but in any case, we see that this Merler energy, the minimum of this object, which is this object up here, uh, by definition, is going to be smaller, or certainly not any bigger, than the hartree fock energy, because the hartree fock choice of gamma is a special case that I can plug in here. So, uh, so maybe this is good, because remember, hartree fock is an upper bound. Now, now we have to start to rely a little bit on numerical analysis. Uh, hartree fock theory, of course, always gives us an energy that's too big. That's the variational principle. Uh, numerical calculations, however, seem to suggest that the Müller energy, when you minimize properly, gives you a lower bound. Now, we don't know how to prove that. Uh, what we can prove is that this is true in NS2 which is very nice, but we'd like to be able to prove it for general n, and that's what the numerical calculations seem to suggest, but we just, we just don't know. Uh, now, there's a defect, namely the, uh, the two-body density in hartree fock was this, and in Merle it's this, so we're very similar. This is a positive function, it turns out. This is positive. It doesn't look positive, but it is positive. This gadget down here is not necessarily positive. So uh, we're replacing the two-body density by something that might be negative. And one of, and not only might be, often is. And one of the conclusions from this is that even if the, there are no nuclei around, the Müller energy is going to be negative, just coming from this exchange term. Now, that might be disturbing. But we should remember that there are other cases where this happens. Uh, <clears throat> and nobody worries about it too much. It happens in Thomas Fermi Dirac theory, and it also happens in Thomas, uh, yes, in Thomas Fermi Dirac Weizsäcker theory, both. So Thomas Fermi Dirac. The Dirac exchange energy, which goes uh, back to the uh, 20s, the Dirac exchange energy is a negative term, and it can overwhelm everything else, because it goes as minus rho to the four-thirds. So this phenomenon of having a negative energy, even when there are no nuclei, is not new. It's an old story. It's bothersome, but it's not new. Uh, now, of course, when this happens, for example, when there are no nuclei, uh, then, of course, there's no minimizing gamma. That is, the, the infimum of the energy is a negative number, but there's no gamma that actually minimizes it. And what it means is that if you try to impose a certain number of electrons, they just sort of leak away to infinity, and that's what you would expect, and uh, that's what happens. So this energy is minus this magic number, 1 over 8, essentially, in natural units, times the number of particles. And so we can think of uh, redefining the energy then as the Müller energy plus this number. Uh, this could be called the correct physical energy, but this thing will not be a lower bound anymore because you've added this positive number. But it's strictly linear, by the way. That's the interesting thing. So, uh, in fact, not only will it not be a lower bound, but numerical data shows that it is strictly not a lower bound. Now, you might wonder why I'm doing this. Uh, what's special about this Miller energy? Well, what's special about it is that people at this Ober Wolfach conference that I told you about were talking about it, and they were actually using it. And with, with slight modifications, of course, there are always modifications, but people are actually using this and getting, for some reason, getting good results. Now, there's no logic behind this. It just happens to be the case. And uh, one would like to understand that a little better. So we pers pursued a mathematical investigation of this theory. Now, one of the intriguing facts about this thing, which caught my eye, 
Uh, let me just repeat this. Um, no. Here we have this exchange. Uh, yeah, no, okay. I, I, I have to go to <coughs> So we have this exchange energy, which is a negative term. And this negative term, remember, is minus the integral of the square root of gamma squared divided by x minus x prime. Looks terrible. In fact, it's convex. All the terms in the uh, energy, including the Hopi Fock energy, except for the exchange term, they're all convex. The one body term is linear in the density. The direct part of the Coulomb repulsion, this density density term, is certainly convex because the Coulomb kernel is positive definite. The one term that's not convex is the exchange energy. But this exchange energy minus the integral of gamma to the one half square uh, happens to be convex. On, namely, if you don't put the minus sign on, it's concave. And uh, in fact, it also is convex if instead of gamma to the one half square, you have gamma to the p times gamma to the one minus p, which is what uh, uh, Miller also played around with. And in all these cases, the energy is convex. So uh, the convexity with the one half in there was due to Wigner and Yana, say, in 1964. Uh, and uh, the convexity when you have general P that was due to me in 1973. It's rather remarkable. You have a negative term, and look, it looks awful. You say, how can a negative term be convex? But it is. And, uh, that's going to be very helpful because this is a property that the hartley fock theory does not have. So one implication of convexity is the triviality of the spin dependence. Namely, uh, if you have one, see in hartley fock theory, the spin comes in in a rather peculiar way. And chemists rarely minimize the hartley fock energy with respect to both the spin coordinates and the spatial coordinates. It's very rarely done. Ever. But here it's trivial, because by convexity, if you have some spin configuration, you can have any other spin configuration given by a unitary, uh, <coughs> unitary transformation. And by averaging over those, you only make the energy better, if at all. Uh, certainly not any worse. So you can always assume, if you want to, in this theory, that there's no spin dependence. You can forget about spin. So on one hand, that's a good thing. But on the other hand, this Miller theory as it stands at the moment is not going to have any useful information, not give any useful information about magnetic properties, but never mind, we don't care for the moment. The Thomas Fermi functional is also convex, and the Hartley Fock functional is not convex. Namely, the exchange term in Hartley Fock, while it looks similar, is not convex. And we do not know if hartley fock energy gives us the, uh, the energy as a convex function of n. I'll come to that later when I'll show you the picture. Uh, now, as a function of uh, gamma and the density matrix, this Miller functional is, as I said, convex, but it's not strictly convex. So we don't know, although we believe, uh, to be the case. We don't know that the minimizer, if there is one, is unique. However, there's a part of the Miller functional that involves only the density of the law, and that is strictly convex. So the conclusion is there could be several minimizers, but they will all have the same density. And <clears throat> that's nice to know. In particular, it means that atoms will be spherical. So spherical symmetry in the atomic case. Uh, we would like to be able to prove that the minimizer, when it exists, is uh, spherically symmetric. Right, is it unique, but we don't know how to do it. Now, the spherical symmetry of atoms is an interesting remark. Uh, at one time, I made the unfortunate remark in front of an audience that contained at least one chemist, and, said, and I said, Adam, uh, quantum chemists like atoms to be spherical. And I was caught up on that. 
I was told quantum chemists do not like atoms to be spherical. Uh, they want to see atoms with little hooks on them. Uh, and, but on the other hand, the quantum chemists that I know want atoms to be spherical. So take your pick. Uh, if you do Hartree Fock theory, the, and you really try to minimize the energy with respect to all possible density matrices, you will generally end up with something that is not spherical for an atom. And so what, chem what chemists usually do is they restrict the Hartree Fock candidates to, to the well known uh, spherical harmonics times radial functions. That's what they usually do. And then they get this nice picture of the. Uh, of an atom is an onion with rings, you know, things like this. But some chemists don't like that. So I don't know which chemists, uh, what, whether there are two or more classes of quantum chemists, but some like the, the atoms to be spherical and others like atoms to have hooks. So take your pick. Okay, now there's some other rigorous results that we can prove. Um, we can prove that there's a minimizer all the way up to the neutral point. Now, presumably it goes beyond. We don't know whether it goes beyond. Uh, in Thomas, well, numerical data suggests it does. In Thomas Fermi theory, what happens is there's a minimizer only up to the neutral point. That is, when n is the total nuclear charge. But in this case, the Miller functional, we can only prove it up to the critical, the neutral point. Uh, <clears throat> The energy in this region, as a function of n, the energy for n between n and this critical value z, uh, is, will certainly be strictly convex. That comes from the convexity. Uh, one of the open conjectures about the Schrodinger ground states that's been around for a long time and which nobody has been able to prove, although numerical data supports it very strongly, is that the real, true Schrodinger ground state energy of an atom as a function of the number of electrons you stick on it, is a convex function of n, or molecule for that matter, not necessarily an atom. So the energy as a function of n should look be a convex curve. Nobody knows how to prove that, but in this theory it drops out. Now, I don't know how to prove it in Hartree Fock theory either. Uh, so this, the other open problem, as I said, is whether this critical n is bigger than z or not. We believe it is. Um, now, provided we do not add this, uh, um, yeah, the, you can ask the question whether the energy itself has satisfies any bound that, that we can. Uh, easily identify, well, the only bound, general bound that we've been able to get is minus this magic number, which I mentioned before, minus a constant. But that that we, can, we can do. So here's a picture of what the energy as a function of density looks like in this Miller theory, which is what people are using nowadays. So here's the energy as a function without adding this constant, that's this curve here. It just comes down, it's convex, until you reach the critical value. We don't know what it is, but we know it's at least z. And then it's strictly linear with this constant. So it looks like that. If you add this constant, then it gets flat. Again, it's the same curve, just pushed up by this uh, constant times n. So this is what the energy as a function of n looks like in the Miller theory uh, for anything atoms, molecules, whatever. We don't know if this is true for the Schrodinger uh, energy. We would like to believe it's true, but nobody has a proof. Now, so just some additional remarks. If you take the Hartree Park functional, then the minimizer, as I said, has to be a slated determinant. The slated determinant has n orbitals. So the rank of the density matrix is n. But in this case, in the Miller functional, things look much more like real atoms. Look. Namely, the de one body density matrix has infinitely many non zero eigenvalues. They add up to n, the eigenvalues add up to n, but they're infinitely many. So, very different from Hartree Fock theory. And 
uh, in particular, there's a set which we believe is empty, namely the set of points on which the density is, uh, sorry, uh, the complement of the set on which the density is zero, and on, this, on the set where the density is non-zero, the range of gamma is the whole of L2. But on the complement where gamma is uh, uh, zero, then uh, on the complement of the set, sorry, where the density is positive, then gamma is strictly zero. So the, the, all the zero eigenvalues lie in some set, and on this set, the, dens the, de the density is zero. There are, are no positive eigenvalues. So we believe that the set where the density is not zero is the whole of R3, and we don't know how to prove that. It turns out to be a rather nasty uh, problem in analysis, which we were not able to overcome. Like Audrey Fox theory, though, there are a few eigenvalues one. So the picture here is that when you have a large number of electrons, maybe large meaning something like two or three, when you have a large number of electrons, you actually get some eigenvalues which are one, just as in the slated determinant. But then you get infinitely many that are below one and add up to n. So n has to be bigger than about two or three for this to happen. But there are actually some that are one. Now, in Hartree Fock theory, it is known that the spectrum of the Hartree Fock operator always has a gap at the nth level. So the uh, again, this is only an unrestricted Hartree Fock theory, but the picture you get in many textbooks is wrong, namely that you have shells in Hartree Fock theory. Sometimes these shells are not completely filled, so you fill them partially. And then there are still eigenvalues of the Hartree Fock operator corresponding to those unfilled states, and those eigenvalues are the same as the ones you filled in. This is a wrong picture. Whatever you do, in Hartree Fock theory, the next eigenvalue beyond the nth is always bigger than the nth. There's always a gap. That's an unrestricted Hartree Fock theory. And the chemists uh, have this curious expression, homo is less than gumo, which it took me three days to figure out. Uh, finally got it. The highest occupied molecular orbital is less than the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. <laughs> so if you if you're at a party with quantum chemists, if you want to make an introduction, you just say, homo humo. <laughs> so it, the same thing would appear to be true in uh, the Miller theory, uh, but we don't know if, it, if, if it's uh, true. Uh, that, 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 that namely, that, remember I said that in general there will be some eigenvalues 1 and then there are infinitely many eigenvalues adding up to n. There should be a gap there. There should be a nice big fat gap between the eigenvalues 1 and the rest. Uh, not just the trivial gap. But we don't know how to estimate this in any way. We also don't know whether atoms bind in this theory. We believe they do. Well, numerical evidence strongly supports that. But we don't know how to prove it. Or at least, no, we don't, I guess. Uh, in top Thomas Fermi theory, as I said, atoms never bind. They do bind in Hartree Fock theory. And the question of binding or not is closely connected with the question of whether the critical n is uh, less than z or not. And now let me, I'm running out of time, so let me stop. I'll just write down, uh, show you what the Miller equations look like. Uh, they're what you think they look like, except there are these funny square roots floating around. So you get an operator. I'm, I'm waving my hands now because there's a lot, a lot of conditions one has to attach to this. But you have a, an operator that looks like the Hartree Fock operator, for those who are familiar with it, the one body kinetic energy, and uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is the Coulomb potential. So then there's this funny operator Z, which is the exchange term. But that, that's gamma to the one-half divided by uh, x. And then the gamma one-half itself uh, comes on first on the right and then the left so that this becomes a self-adjoint operator. And all of this stuff acts on the orbitals, that is, the eigenfunctions of the, uh, the one-body density vectors. And then here, there are some eigenvalues. Those are not the same as in Hartree-Fock theory. Here, the eigenvalues 
apart from this chemical potential, the eigenvalues are zero unless the eigenfunction corresponds to an eigenvalue one, in which case these numbers have to appear. So uh, I, I realize that was not very comprehensible, but I'm running out of time, so I won't bother to explain it, except to say that the analog of the hartree fock equations are much more complicated. That's the message I want to convey. Uh, and it's probably not a good idea to try to solve these equations. Rather, it's a much better idea to try to guess what functionals and what orbitals you want to have and then use those to make a fair calculation and hope for the best. That's in fact what can is true. So thank you very much for your attention. But the spin polarization effects are tiny effects compared to everything else, compared to the total and the spin energy, uh, small compared to the total ground state energy. So if we can get the one can get the ground state energy to the leading order. Of this is already just for a just for chemical application. It's absolutely. Well, but then you can add any number of corrections. Uh, atomic sure. energy levels are filled. You know? yeah. And if the filling of the atomic energy levels is not correct, so what? 
I'm sorry, sir. Well, well, say well, that again. The theory doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Hmm? If, 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 you, uh, if you decide, for example, if you want to apply such a theory, for example, to understand the binding of uh, uh, nitro, uh, uh, nitrogen oxide, yeah? you have one atom which is thin polarized and another one which has no total. Mm -hmm. You combine the two to form a paramagnetic molecule. Mm -hmm. so you, could, you will never get the correct answer. No, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I don't think you have to get the spin polarization correct to get the binding correct. But, but look, I, I want to emphasize again that when chemists use this, they also add any number of corrections to this, to this basic uh, structure that I mentioned, this Miller structure. And I, I'm sure that this, these kinds of things can be taken into account if you want to. The main, main problem right now, for us at least, was getting the basic underlying structure of this Miller functional understood. Uh, mathematically. I understand it's, a, it's an interesting mathematical problem, but uh, I do not see at the moment uh, uh, whether it uh, could be a fruitful approach uh, uh, to quantum chemistry of molecules. Well, all I can tell you is this is what people are doing. I mean, a, 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 a whole conference full of people doing this. So, uh, what can I tell you? But you have to do something. At the present state, people basically don't know how to calculate much of anything in a reliable way without having a special uh, program or whatever code for a particular kind of molecular structure. Let me start that sentence again. It wasn't coherent. Uh, if you uh, agree, if you're willing to have a special code for everything you do, then you can probably calculate things. But the trouble is that there's no general mechanism, at least that was my understanding, it still is my understanding, I have a general mechanism that will understand uh, or give you the structure of molecules uh, with any reliability. It just doesn't exist. So there are ad hoc methods all over the place. Yeah. Well, I really can't agree. Yeah. All right. there, there, there are well-established tools yeah, that produce the correct answer for the molecular structure, for the structure of solids, and even for more, much more complex problems like phase transformations, like chemical reactions uh, uh, among molecules, with an accuracy that is sufficient to draw real conclusions. Yeah. You can nowadays predict, for example, the heat of activation for a molecular reaction with a good accuracy based on conventional con sham density function theory with the best available functional that I, I just don't agree. Uh, there are all, all the methods that I've seen that all had pocket that address this some specific uh, problem. And the general con sham method is just not general. It's, so we have to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a mixture of what they're doing. So I don't want that. Anyway, thank you very much.